So thank you very much for having me here. I have to confess, I feel a bit like an intruder uh, because I am not an algebraic geometer by trade, although I can pretend to be one very briefly. You like so, intruders, so that's yes. good. <laughs> that is, uh, uh, the, 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 there is going to be some homotopy theory in this talk. So uh, if uh, the, the, uh, the encouragement to ask even elementary question is doubly so, especially since I'm in a slightly different field than I expect most of the public. I am trying to make it as accessible as possible, but I might uh, <laughs> slip something out if I'm not, if if I don't notice it. So please do ask me, even if the question seems stupid. So okay, so this talk is about Hermitian K theory. So Hermitian K theory is, a, a, I won't say a cohomology theory on rings or more generally schemes, or even more generally uh, the. Uh, that has a very long history. So I put here a few names of the people that have um, worked on it, starting from the prehistory with Witt, and then going on with Knebusch, Karubi, Hanitsky, Weiss, Williams, Walsh, Lichten, Spitzbeck, Lurie, Balmer, and I'm sure I missed a bunch of people. Um, so that's the first line. Uh, and in the second line, I put a group of nine people, uh, which I belong, I am, of course, this um, very hidden one, uh, that have done a lot of work recently. Uh, we, we put out three papers, and a fourth one will come out soon, uh, trying to giving a, a more modern setup uh, for Hermitian key theory, following ideas of Jacob Lurie, that clarifies, I think, a lot of relationship between different variants of Hermitian key theory. Uh, I will uh, say when some work, when some theorem is due to this collaboration, and for brevity, I'll just write hashtag nine, uh, because writing nine names every time is very long and time consuming. So there are Batis Kalme, Manuel Edotto, Jonathan Harpas, Fabian Heberstreit, Markus Land, Christian Moy, and myself, Thomas Nikolaus, and Wolfgang Steinle. And no, I wasn't looking. Yes, I did memorize the name of my co authors. <laughs> okay. Without further ado, let's start with uh, uh, un the underived story, the, the basic story. So let me recall, and I'll also say I will work with rings for simplicity. Uh, all, all that I'm going to say will work for schemes as well, but it's slightly more technical. And uh, to keep it simple, I will just treat the affine case. Uh, please ask if you're, if you're curious. So, okay, the underived story, let me remember how K theory works. So we have R, a ring, and let's pretend it's commutative, although it's not really necessary for what I'm about to say. Uh, then you can take uh, this category, proj R is the category of finitely generated projective R modules. So vector bundles over spec R, I guess, if you want to take a geometric picture. And then you can form the isoclasses of elements of Proj R. So, and this is a, a commutative monoid together with the direct sum. And this form a commutative monoid about commutative monoids are tricky and complicated objects, so we don't like them. Uh, so for simplicity, we group complete them. So what is this group completion operation? It's just formally adding inverses. It's if you want left adjoint from the inclusion of commutative models into uh, all abelian groups. And the end result is what we call the K0 group of the ring. You might think of a similar construction that uses um, a coherent R modules, or you know, finitely generated in an Ethereum case where you have to do a little more complicated things. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. That's what's known as G-theory nowadays, at least since the Thomas and Trouble paper in a long time ago. But in, I think in older literature it was perhaps written as K-upper note, but I'm not going to follow this, or K-prime sometimes in Quillen's paper. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about K-theory of projective R, finitely generated projective R modules. And that's just the definition. And that's an interesting invariant. And uh, let's compute it for a bunch of cases. So if R is local, you know that um, all finitely generated projective R modules are free. So uh, 
the only thing that's left is the rank. So K0 of R is just Z given by the rank. And if you have another example, if R is a dedicated domain, there is a theorem that tells you that every projective R module is determined up to isomorphism by its rank and its determinant. By determinant, I mean its top exterior power. And this is reflected in the fact that this is indeed the direct sum of Z plus the Picard group of our ring. Uh, okay, these should, I'm not sure how known these things are. These are both relatively elementary commutative algebra exercises. Maybe the second one is slightly trickier, but um, it's, um, they're well-known facts. So, okay, so that's um, K theory. But I promised you quadratic forms. And in fact, you can do uh, more stuff. So let me tell you what a, well, what a symmetric bilinear form is first. So, so here R is commutative. Although we will see later how to generalize, but for now, let's keep it very, very simple. Our commutative asymmetric bilinear form is a pair p comma uh, b let's call it b where p is a finitely generated projective r module and b well i'm going to first write this so it's an element of these fixed points on this home set but concretely it's a map P times P to R, which is R by linear, and such that B of X, Y is equal to B of Y, X. That's the symmetry. And we say that P, B is unimodular. So it's a symmetric linear form, sorry. Uh, is unimodular if the induced map P to P dual, which is adjoint, if you want, that's the map sending X to B X blank, is an isomorphism. So the terminology arises from Z, uh, where unimodular form was one for which the matrix representing B had determinant plus or minus one. Uh, but we can adapt it more generally and say that the determinant of the matrix needs to be a unit. So it makes unimodular. I don't know. Uh, there are people objecting, saying no unimodular should have determinant always plus or minus one, but that's the wrong definition and I'm not going to, to dwell on it any further. Uh, okay. And also sometimes people call these non-degenerate, sometimes call these perfect pairings. There is a lot of terminology. Different people mean different things with non-degenerate. I will stick with unimodular for, you know, for making sure that it's not ambiguous. Okay. And okay, an isomorphism of symmetric bilinear forms is, uh, well, is an iso of, uh, in, in Prosh R sending B to B. That is, if you precompose with B by the, with the isomorphism, you get the B for the other module. And so you can do the same thing, uh, which I'm going to call with a slightly Baroque name. Uh, bear with me for a, for a moment. Um, GWGS0, uh, I can take iso classes of unimodular, symmetric bilinear forms with the direct sum, which I guess I haven't defined, but you know, it's the direct sum at the level of modules and it's the orthogonal sum of the level of bilinear forms. So you get the bilinear form if you want, B plus B prime, X, X prime, Y, Y prime is just B, X, Y, 
plus b prime x prime y prime. Uh, it's the orthogonal form that I guess was usually taught in linear algebra at some point. I'm not exactly sure. And then you, you, you group complete as before. And this actually is very important uh, because, for example, in the case of Z, classifying uh, unimodular symmetric bilinear forms up to isomorphy, uh, to isometry, is uh, essentially impossible. It's, um, I think, what's called a wild classification problem. There is no, no set of invariants that can describe those things. But once you group complete, suddenly stuff becomes easy. Um, so I guess the flip side seems to be that I have no sense of how much damage group completion or I, I damage. You can, you can actually, yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by damage. There is one thing um, which I don't want to dwell too much, but you're identifying metabolics with hyperbolics. Um, that's one thing you do. Uh, but there are also um, weird things. I mean, it, it, it is a destructive operation, I guess. It's not, uh, it's not, you don't preserve everything, but it has the advantage that you can actually, you know, say what the answer is instead of, you know, we are saying, I don't know, there are a countable set of isomorphism classes, which is, you know, not a very um, useful piece of information. So this is, okay, so let me give you some examples about this. So, okay. Oh, I forgot to give you an example of bilinear form. So if U is in R cross, this is the bilinear form R. If B U, B U is X comma Y, it's just a U X Y. That's a symmetric bilinear form. Uh, and it's unimodular exactly because U is invertible. So, okay, but why did I come up with this? Because, okay, one thing, it's the analog of um, what I, I was saying uh, for the local rings before. So if R is local, well, I cannot compute GW, GS anymore. Uh, by the way, GS stands for genuine symmetric and GW for growth and bit, growth and bit, sorry. But I cannot compute this guy, but we know that this is generated by, elements of the form u or u in r cross. And in fact, you can even write down the relations if you want. It's not that hard. It's something that already bit did it in, back in the day. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is not z, of course, because we have a, a ton of possible choices of units. Also, uh, I'll also say that, of course, u this depends on the, the class of U module squares. So you do have some, uh, some control, but. And then do you have to subtract as well? So it sounds like you have to actually. Uh, it's generated as an abelian group, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so it isn't true that the before you group complete, it's not generated necessarily. So yeah, it's not true that, so it, it is and it isn't. It is, if two is invertible, it is true that every symmetric bilinear form is diagonalizable uh, for over a local ring. Uh, that is absolutely true. Um, but so the two invertible in this case means the characteristic, the residue characteristic is not two. But if the residue characteristic is two, that is not true anymore. Uh, you do have, and that's exactly what you're losing actually. You're basically forcing everything to be diagonalizable. Ah, great, thanks. Um, that's, uh, but okay, that's okay. Uh, oh, sorry, so, a, a vacuous question. Uh, why, why GS? What does it stand for? Oh, yeah, sorry. GS stands for genuine symmetric. We will see several variants. And I would like to call it symmetric, but this conflicts with other terminology um, that I don't really don't want to conflict with. It's essentially symmetric, but in a strict sense. You we will see later what the weaker sense is. Uh, there are, uh, and, and, and that, oh, I see. And that was genuine, genuine symmetric or generalized? Genuine symmetric. Genuine yeah. symmetric. Um, there are, there are a, a huge amount of, I mean, that, the point that I'm going to make soon is that there are a huge amount of variants you can have of this thing. And we will find a better way of systematizing them. Okay, uh, but okay, I haven't. Ooh, it's okay. 
Uh, let me give you a few more examples. So if F is a finite field, you have a complete description, actually. This guy is determined completely by the rank and the determinant. So it's Z times Z mod two, or more canonically, it's actually Z times F cross mod two. By, by mod two, I mean a modulo all the squares. Um, uh, and you know, of course, if X is a finite field, F cross mod two is Z mod two. Uh, exercise if you haven't seen it before, but I assume you have. Uh, uh, characteristic not to, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> characteristic not to, yeah, thank you, sorry. Uh, the, the next example is indeed characteristic two. So F a perfect field of characteristic two, so in particular also a finite field, this guy is just determined by the rank. Uh, since, um, well, this follows from these, since every class here is represented by a square, so it's equivalent to the class of one. And, um, okay, um, a slightly less trivial example, you can take GWGS0 of R, and that's uh, Z, given by, the, uh, sorry, it's Z times Z given by rank as signature, only the, the map is, I have to write it in a slightly Baroque way being, since the rank and the signature are always congruent to mod two. So that's, I guess, that's the, the way of giving the components. Or if you want, you can think of the, the subgroup of Z mod Z where the two elements are congruent mod two and then the map is literally rank and signature. But I don't know, up to you what you, what you prefer. Uh, and that's, of course, Sylvester's theorem. And then you can take GWGS zero of Z. This has a map. These groups, I haven't said it, but they're obviously factorial. And this map is actually an isomorphism. So um, symmetric linear forms over Z are completely determined by the, their real image uh, after group completion. That's not true um, before group completion, of course, but after group completion. That's, that's what it is. Okay. Um, ooh, I forgot to do one thing. Sorry. Okay. Um, where were we? Yes. So we have maps, important maps. So we have a map GW0 GS to K0 that just forgets. So I'm calling FGT that forgets the form. And remember only the underlying symmetric, uh, the underlying projective module. And I also have an interesting map K0 to GW0 GS, which is called hype, which sends P to P plus the jewel of P together with the symmetric linear form that I'm going to impressionistically write 0, 1, 1, 0. Or precisely, this is B uh, x phi x prime phi prime is um, phi x prime plus phi prime x. And that's the hyperbolic map. And moreover, we have a C2 action on K0, sending P to P dual. And these maps are C2 equivariants. It's forgetful and hyperbolic maps are C2 equivariant when you give GW the trivial, the trivial action. Can you remind me what C2 was again? Uh, C2, sorry, C2 is the finite group of order two. Ah, oh, great. Okay, I know that group. Uh, we, we, I am trying, in this setting, I try to write Z mod two when I think of the ring and C2 when I think of the group, since there are, of course, they're canonically unique, but uh, uh, it's uh, yep, no, I'm happy. <laughs> um, okay, and this is C2 equivariant, of course. These maps are so the forgetful is uh, well, the same if you have a unimodular linear form P is isomorphic to the P dual because you know you have a, you have a unimodular linear form, and vice versa, the hyperbolic of P and P dual are the same because I'm just swapping the summons. Okay, and the question one is what's the difference? Between 
K0, uh, sorry, GW0 and K0 fixed points. And one in a very, if one were very, very optimistic, one could hope that these two are isomorphic, but they're they are not. Uh, but we will see that this dream is not as unreasonable as one could think at first. We will see later that once you derive everything, this dream becomes extremely reasonable, actually. Uh, but that's the baby version, baby homotopy limit problem. So there is this, this map, forget map. Yeah, how far this map is from an isomorphism. And at this point, the fact that it's called baby or homotopy or limit is not clear. Problem. Is I mean, it's a, there is no homotopy limit. I'm calling baby because it's, a, it's a, because there is nothing derived. Uh, it's, it's just the most elementary thing you can write. And of course, the answer is no, that they're not the same at all. And we will need the higher groups to, to provide correct in terms. OK. Um, but I, I promise you that I put this weird declaration here because, for example, you could consider, well, the first thing is that you could consider anti-symmetric forms also. Uh, that's, that's also allowed, and you could do the same definitions. But you could also do another guy and take quadratic forms. So what are quadratic forms? Just, I assume probably most of the audience knows this already, but for the, the sake of uh, giving all things, a quadratic form is a pair, P, Q, where P is in Proj R, and Q is a map from P to R, satisfying these two uh, weird properties, which essentially are formal, formulating that Q is given by a homogeneous polynomial of degree two. But let me write Q of R X is R squared Q of X. And then the, the other property, this function here, which is defined as Q X plus Y minus Q of X minus Q of Y is symmetric by linear. Well, it's symmetric by definition, but being bilinear is a condition here. And it turns out that this is the same thing as being homogeneous of degree two. And I'll leave a bit exercise for the audience that hasn't seen it. Uh, quadratic forms on P are in one-to-one -one correspondence with something very similar to what symmetric bilinear forms were. Only remember for symmetric bilinear forms, we need to take the fixed points. Here instead we take the quotient. And the map here is sending B to the function X goes to B X comma X. And that's just, okay. I'm not going to prove it. You can, it it's not hard. Um, if you sit down, I think in 20 minutes at most, you should uh, come up with a proof of this. And okay, oh, I forgot to say what unimodular means. And B, uh, Q is unimodular if BQ is this, this polarization, this BQ here. Okay. And so you can do the same thing as before and get GW0. Uh, this time I'm going to call it GQ, genuine quadratic. And this is unimodular quadratic forms. Group completed. Uh, we will again need a direct sum. And then you can do, there is a version of anti-symmetric, as I said. Anti-symmetric. Hermitian, if R has an involution. And in fact, there is also a notion of minus one quadratic, uh, which is uh, the equivalent of quadratic for anti-symmetric. I'm not going to define it slightly 
Um, it's essentially an alternating form together with a quadratic refinement mod two, but okay. Um, and then you can do, as I said, alternating forms, even forms, there are all sorts of variants. And so at some point, uh, one would like to sit down and try to come up with, okay, but there must be a single way of, of talking about these things without having to, to make huge lists in all the theorems. And that's actually the definition I'm about to give. But okay, before I give this definition, are there questions? No. Okay. So I have to say there are there have been several attempts in the past to generalize these this, this notions to find a unique language. And I think that this one is fundamentally equivalent to something that Wall did back in the day. And it's very and it's due essentially to Jacob Lurie. Uh, that came up. So I will present, I'm going to present the underived version today while Lurie worked fully derived, which is actually a good idea for other reasons that I'll expand later. But um, let me keep it simple. So a form functor on R. And here R is not necessarily um, commutative, by the way, it is a functor kappa. This is a lowercase kappa. It's a weird um, Greek letter that is the origin of the modern letter Q. And we introduce it because there are way too many Qs in this subject. And so we needed something that was Q-like, but was also a different letter. So we went for this kappa. Um, so it's a functor from prog r up into abelian groups, uh, satisfying two properties. Uh, property one is that kappa of zero is zero, and property two is okay. If you take kappa of p plus q, we know that it decomposes canonically as kappa of p plus kappa of q plus. Uh, B coppa of P comma Q. That's just because you have maps like these inclusions and projections. The existence of these maps forces you this decomposition and B coppa P comma Q, that the condition is isomorphic, is of the form, uh, well, map, let me say, I mean the, the, the home in in R, actually, let me say home, from P to dual of Q for dual prosh R up to prosh R duality. And here I am smuggling something under the rug uh, because this um, B coppa PQ comes with a canonical symmetry. So you have a canonical for example, equivalence B coppa B PQ and B QP, of course, coming from the symmetry of the dark sum. And this induces actually a natural transformation eta from one to DD up. And I am asking not only that this functor is representable by some DQ, but also that this natural transformation is an isomorphism. That's the condition of being a duality. But the point is that this duality is completely determined. So this is a condition. This is not a structure I'm putting on kappa. This is a condition. The condition is this functor is representable and the induced natural transformation you get by abstract nonsense is uh, an isomorphism. Okay. So that's what I mean. It's, it's given by a duality. Uh, okay, and what, how should you think of this? You should think of this kappa as telling you which kind of forms you can put on your, uh, on your projective module. So for example, you can take kappa P to be the abelian group of uh, symmetric bilinear forms on P of quadratic forms of anti-symmetric forms. Uh, by linear forms, etc., and all those type of things to give examples of these. And one important thing, these two give the same duality. 
It's just a standard duality. But for example, anti-symmetric give a different duality okay, with the same functor, P goes to P dual, but a different double dual identification. P goes to P dual dual. This kind is the minus one. That's where the sign of the of the anti-symmetric is coming from. Ah, so something subtle is happening right now. Do you, would you mind seeing that again? I think when you started, I didn't realize that subtlety was coming. Oh. Not exactly uh, the, the point is that the duality, so this guy is producing a duality, which is not just a functor, but a functor equipped with a natural transformation like this. And if you take symmetric bilinear forms and quadratic forms, you get the same duality, even through it. If you do anti-symmetric bilinear forms or alternating or minus one quadratic or whatever, you get a different duality, which has the same functor, but the double dual identification has a sign. Okay, that's great. Which is uh, where the anti-symmetric is, is hidden. You will think, oh, but it's the same dual, it's the same functor. That how can they be different? And the, the difference is in this natural transformation here. Ah, okay. So that's a very, I don't know, civilized and natural place where this natural transformation. Okay, that's a great example. And then you can also do Hermitian forms, of course, then, or you can do you know, symmetric bilinear forms with value in an invertible module, and then the duality will be different, will be home in that invertible module. You can do all sorts of things. And also, just for, um, and then I'll, I'll stop with uh, this, uh, this thing, but okay, you also have a map, copper P to copper P plus P, and that's just the Pre image by the full map. By full map, I mean the map from P plus P to P given by summing the, the coordinates. And uh, then these, uh, so this decomposes as we have seen as copper P plus copper P uh, plus um, uh, home from P to the dual of P by the fact that it's a form functor. And then I can project to home P, the dual of P. And I'm going to say this takes a Q here and it maps it to something that's called Q sharp, which is a map from P to the dual of P. So you can see if you have a quadratic form, a copa quadratic form on your projective module, you should get a map from P to the dual of P. And you do using this. And you can check in the cases, in all the cases I say that you get exactly what you would expect to get. Um, intuitively, the, the map from P to the dual of P that you, for example, if you have symmetric bilinear forms, this recovers just the, the map that you obtain by adjoining over the symmetric bilinear form. I'm not going to do the details now, but it's, it's what you expect. I'm just showing that you can define a thing. And okay, and then you define Q in copper P to be unimodular as you expect if Q sharp is an isomorphism. If the map to the double dual, to the dual is an isomorphism. And then you can define GW R copa, GW zero R copa as taking the copa quadratic forms and group complete. And this definition just works. And this is not the most general definition we can make, uh, but let me keep it for now. So, okay, I think I'll uh, stop here with the, the basic algebra. Um, uh, maybe I, let me actually give you an, uh, just an example. Sorry, if you take the genuine quadratic Z, the one given by quadratic forms, that's also uh, Z times Z, but actually, I want to say that it's um, eight uh, Z times Z in the sense that this has a map to the Z times Z um, that I wrote here before, the joint symmetric, and this map is the inclusion of this subgroup. It's not the isomorphism. This is just a classical theorem that if you have a quadratic refinement on, um, on a symmetric bilinear forms over Z, it has to have signature divisible by eight. This is a, 
Uh, one of my co-authors actually left it as an exercise in a talk. I think it's a bit over ambitious. Uh, I think it's not as trivial as an exercise as he sold it, uh, but, uh, but it's fun. You can find the explanation in the book by Milner and Kuzmoller, if you're curious. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was not you didn't have I think I thought you didn't need to have both both coordinates divisible by eight, but just the um with just the just the signature um just this yeah just the signature is divisible by eight actually you're right um the question is how do I don't worry about it don't worry about it Sorry. Uh, okay, it's the subgroup. Okay, it's the subgroup corresponding to signature congruent to zero mod eight. Let me not uh, uh, fret about the exact coordinates I'm using for this group. Uh, but just to say that they're not everything. And even when they're abstract isomorphic as a group, it doesn't mean that they're the same group, right? Because the canonical comparison map might not be an isomorphism. And this is actually important. Okay. Um, other questions? Because I'm about to introduce homotopy theory into the mix to define the higher groups. So I don't know how much the audience here is familiar if I throw out words like infinity categories, infinity space, and etc. So I thought I would um, give a very quick introduction to these ideas. So the main object here is going to be space, which is what I call the infinity category of spaces or sometimes in, um, following Clausen and Schultz, sometimes called the infinity category of animas, or animae, anime, I'm not sure. I, the fact that people cannot agree on the plural of this word is part of what annoys me about it, uh, but uh, there are other. It is true that calling them spaces is slightly misleading, although that's very traditional in homotopy theory. Uh, so. The, the, this is not a category, unfortunately, it's an infinity category, but you really shouldn't be afraid of it. Um, it behaves essentially like a normal category. So it objects, you should think of them as homotopy types. And for every X, Y in spaces, you get another homotopy type. So this is sort of like the category of sets, where the home from a set is a homotopy type, which you can think of like the, the map, it's the mapping space. So it's the homotopy type of a space where points are maps from X to Y, continuous maps, and paths are homotopies, and then higher maps are, you know, families parameterized by whatever uh, space you have. So homotopy classes of maps like these, you should think of them as uh, families k times x to y up to homotopy. And sorry, when I say homotopy types, I mean weak homotopy types if you care about this. If you don't, ignore it. Uh, uh, homotopy types are reasonable stuff like CW contexts, just for the sake of precision. And it's not really important. What's important here is that you can take groupoids you know, just normally groupoids, you know, categories where all morphisms are invertibles, and you can map them to spaces. And essentially, if you have a groupoid X, you can map it to the space where little x runs through the um, isomorphism classes in curly X of B of the automorphism group. And this is sometimes written as geometricalization of X. And it's actually, I wrote it in a very uncanonical form, but there is a canonical description of, of this. And the point is that this embedding is fully faithful in the sense that map this homotopy type here is the same as the geometricalization of the groupoid of functors. So um, it's, you can identify groupoids with one, one types. The image is called one types. So the, the essential image 
are homotopy types x with pi i x is zero for all i greater than one. What are called one types? You call it it's like one hyphen type like that. That's one mean. hyphen types. Yeah. Um, but okay, that's. I mean, as you can imagine, you know, for if you have a groupoid, you can recover the fundamental groupoid. In fact, the fundamental groupoid is the left adjoint of this map. So I think that remembers only pi zero and pi one. Um, okay. Okay, why I, did I say that? Oh yeah, because I want to say, so in space, and okay, I don't want to give the details, but there is a good notion of commutative monoids and uh, abelian groups, uh, objects which are called infinity spaces and infinity groups, respectively. And okay, uh, they have also other names, but let me not bombard you with terminology. I'll use these short ones. And uh, the inclusion e infinity space uh, groups inside the infinity spaces has a left adjoint as before, which is go I'm going to write as you know x goes to x group complete. Exactly the same story as in sets. So to make sure I I, I understand, there's like a, a there's sets are to commutative monoids are to abelian groups as spaces are to e infinity spaces are to e infinity groups yes right. that's exactly the, the, the picture is exactly the same in fact sets also sits fully faithful inside spaces because it sits fully faithful inside monoid uh, groupoids and the the e infinity spaces that are discrete are exactly the commutative monoids and the e infinity groups that are discrete are exactly the abelian groups and okay, and, and, and I'm guessing probably that metaphor is not enough to let me successfully guess the definition of the infinity space of the infinity space. Like uh, probably not. Although after a few attempts, you might. Uh, but if you want, these are also sometimes called gamma spaces following Siegel. I think that was the earliest definition of something that uh, was like that. The, 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 the definition, the name infinity spaces, comes from the work of Peter May which gave a different model for them, although I prefer Siegel's model personally. I think it's it's uh, cleaner. Um, uh, but I mean, I could write it down for you. I mean, it's, it's a one-line definition, but I don't- That's okay. To. Yeah, that's great. The, the, what the point is, the point is that this functor from groupoid to spaces uh, respects this structure in the sense that it sends uh, symmetric monoidal groupoids to e infinity spaces. So, in fact, the, and a structure of an e infinity space on a groupoid is exactly the same thing as a symmetric monoidal structure. It's exactly the same thing. Um, you can, for which you can see that the definition of infinity space is slightly more subtle, perhaps, than you would expect, because the definition of symmetric model structure is slightly more subtle. Uh, but there is a nice way found by Siegel to package these things, which is also, by the way, the only definition of symmetric model structure on a category that I can remember, uh, because the classical one has all these weird axioms left and right that they can never uh, remember, while the, the Siegel model is at least a, a one line, as I said. So. At least it's two lines, perhaps. But okay. Uh, okay, but okay. Why, why did I do this categorical preliminaries? Is because now I can do what homotopy theories do, and don't forget to isoclasses. So I can take, I can define the K-theory space by taking the full groupoid. So this is the groupoid of projective R modules. This little iota there is just um, uh, saying keep take the maximum subgroupoid 
So forget all morphisms that are not invertible. And you group complete it in the infinity space sense. And you know, if you want to put a, a bar to remember, but since the embedding is fully faithful, I, I and many other people tend not to distinguish between the groupoid and the, the space, the homotopy type, because that they're literally the same information. Okay, and you group complete this. So that's a so from my homotopy theorist perspective, this is a much more natural definition because I'm not doing the violent operation of collapsing the isomorphism classes and forgetting things. And at the same thing, I can take GWR kappa. I can take the, the group or they didn't give a name to this thing. So I'll just write in words of unimodular kappa quadratic forms and group complete. And I have to say a big warning. This operation here preserves discrete objects. So groupoids, so spaces that are have no homotopy groups except from pi nodes, but not one types. So if you start with something that's come from a groupoid, it's not necessarily a groupoid anymore. And that's the whole point. These guys indeed have a lot of homotopy groups. Oh boy, they do they. Uh, they have very, very much homotopy, very, very many homotopy groups. Okay, so that was a lot of homotopy theory very, very quickly. So uh, maybe let me let me ask about the last thing just to make sure it's settled in my mind. So you have so you have this group completion, which is this uh, E infinity, uh, the analog of group completion, and it and as soon as you have isomor as soon as you have uh, isotropy groups, non-trivial, as soon as you have automorphisms. It does interesting things, and then suddenly it becomes you know, it does terrible things. Yeah, suddenly it becomes uncomputable. The results, basically. <laughs> I mean, you, it, I'm saying uncomputable, but that's unfair. Actually, you can give explicit geometric models for what this operation does. The question is just computing the homotopy groups of this thing is very, very hard. In fact, that the original definition was one of these models using Quillen's plus construction. And um, you can actually write down a space, like an explicit cell structure of the thing. Unfortunately, as you've probably known, if you've ever taken a homotopy theory class, completing the homotopy groups of a space for which you know a cell structure, even if you know everything about cell structure, that cell structure is still kind of tricky. <laughs> and by kind of tricky, I think it's basically an open problem and proven to be impossible to do. So, okay. Um, and just by factoriality, we get uh, uh, maps R copper to K of R. This is the forgetful because we have forgetful functor on groupoids and we have an hyperbolic functor on groupoids as well. And so we get this and also a C2 action, C2 acting on K, R, and then I remember the copa here because the C2 action depends on the duality, which remember was part of the data. Now, in this case, the action actually depends only on the functor of the duality. It doesn't depend on, well, okay, it depends on what you mean by C2 action. Let me say this way, the action on homotopy groups depend on, depends only on the functor of D. And so the full action on the space depends also on the identification with the double dual. So the, the action is not completely determined by what it does on homotopy groups. There is additional stuff. Of course, this depends only on the dual. It doesn't depend for the full kappa, but for limiting the proliferation of symbols, I'll just keep the kappa here and nothing more. And so, um, oh, I think I am going to be Quickly, almost out of time, actually. How much time do I have left? So I feel like the organizers allowed to say you started a few minutes late. Yeah, so yeah, so you did start a few minutes late. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it's 10 minutes good or how? 10 minutes, okay. Yeah, so the question is, okay, what's... So we have a map from uh, R copper to K R copper, and this is 
homotopy fixed points, this is just uh, fixed points, uh, the notion of fixed points in space or infinity groups, whatever, it doesn't matter. As fixed points in groups and in, in, in sets are the same, that's the same thing for spaces and the infinity groups. And by, by fixed points, I mean that the limit over the diagram B from the groupoid with one object and C2 automorphism to my category. So that's the homotopy limit problem. So that's an um, isomorphism. And I'll add a small wrinkle here after group completion, after two completion. So I'm not asking, uh, I'm not going to ask the behavior on homotopy groups. On first approximation, you can think after two completing on homotopy groups. That's not literally true, but there is a notion of two completion for infinity groups in the same way in which there is for abelian groups. And, uh, and it's, it's also written by the same format. It's at the limit of x mod 2 to the n. Only you have to redefine what lim and mod is. And corresponds to the derived to completion in the case of classical abelian groups, if you've ever seen that. So, so this in this situation, so you're saying that there's some reasons for this to be sort of maybe for experts obviously wrong if you did not to complete. And then this gets uh, well, no, that's not true. That's obviously wrong. The point is that you can also you can immediately understand what happens after you invert two. Ah, okay. And it's and there are obvious counterexamples. The classical one being so it, it you have precisely you have a. This is true after inverting two, if and only if R has no real residue fields, no residue fields that can be ordered. Um, it's uh, maybe obvious is a big word, but you know you, you can completely understand what's going on there, and it's uh, it's not super interesting. I mean, it is interesting, but it's uh, it's not very deep. And this turns out to be this was sort of the, the version. So this is the homotopy limits problem was proposed originally by Thomason. And um, this was, uh, this is true surprisingly often. And in fact, I think that after changing the statement slightly, although I haven't figured out actually how much to change it, I would expect it to be always true. Uh, sorry, non -coppa, not copper. Uh, I want the genuine symmetric here, so that's very important. We have seen already that genuine symmetric and quadratic are different, so they cannot both be the homotopy fixed points. Uh, um, okay, uh, so let me actually tell you a bunch of cases where this is known. Uh, so the answer is this is true whenever. Uh, we have a couple of finiteness assumptions that are essentially due to the, the fact that this statement is not quite the, the statement that we would like to have. Uh, the virtual cohomological dimension of two of R is finite. And here I mean the, the supremum of the virtual cohomological dimension of all residue fields with this thing. Actually, let me write it. Supremum. Of the, of the cohomological dimension of two of k p minus one for p in spec r is finite. The dimension of r is finite and one half is in r. So this is a theorem by, okay, who crees arms b in the case R field, and then generalized based on that case uh, by um, Karubi, Schlichting, and Ostbeer. Okay, this is true in this case, and this uses essentially motivic homotopy theory. Uh, to, to be solved. Uh, it's essentially the a study of the motivic spectral sequence for K theory. Um, uh, plus the Milner conjecture. A lot of this stuff uses the Milner conjecture, of course, and the block cattle conjecture and a lot of stuff. Uh, but this goes with the territory. Um, this is true for perfect fields of characteristic two. And this was done by us in our paper number three of the series. 
Combination K theory three. And it is true and that this is actually basically a remark after we set up all the theory that we do in the first two papers actually. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's pleasant when these, these results come out so nicely. And it's true for uh, orders in global fields of characteristic two. And this is still this is slightly more tricky case. And note that this is not, I'm not saying that two is invertible in the order. I'm just saying that two is non-zero. That is a very big difference. Um, and actually, let me put a couple of unpublished results. So this is true for fields of characteristic two, uh, for fields F of characteristic two, such that the two dimension is finite. And this is my result unpublished yet. which essentially takes the observation for perfect fields and soups it up using results by Geisel and Levin and um, about the K-theory fields of characteristic two to try to adapt it. And uh, from these, you can actually, actually it's, it's, it doesn't follow immediately from the statement, but from the proof, you can also deduce that it's true for orders in all global fields. So you given what I do before, given what we did before, uh, this is uh, a characteristic different from two, sorry. And uh, so given what I said before, this is essentially need just to cover the case of global fields of characteristic two. And this is again, uh, stuff I am currently working on. And I hope to prove it more generally. Uh, the problem is the jump from uh, fields to Hanselian local rings, uh, which requires some more refined argument. You need to prove that two things are equal. Uh, and when two is invertible, both things are zero for rather trivial reasons. Uh, so they are in particular equal. Uh, but when two is, is uh, it's not invertible, they are, or if you want the Hanselian local ring is uh, dyadic, the uh, the two things are non-zero, although they are equal in all the cases I could I could check. So I have hope that um, I can. So it's uh, so these so that's it's okay. So the hard part is getting from field and selling local. That's like an interesting. That's uh, well. The point is that when two is invertible, a GW satisfies rigidity. So GW of an Ancelian local ring is equivalent. What does rigidity mean in that? Yeah, the rigidity means in the sense of Gabor rigidity. So if R is a non dyadic and salient local ring, GW, and, um, and it, it doesn't matter actually the decoration here, GWR mapping to GW of the residue field is an isomorphism. Okay, great. And the same thing is true for, well, okay, uh, let me to complete. Just for so it feels like a deformation esque, a deformation theory esque problem. So, not to, yeah. so I mean, this is a classical theorem actually by Susling, and this is follows but work by Balmer and Knebusch. Well, in the wrong in the wrong order actually. Knebusch the Knebusch theorem is much older than what Balmer did, but okay. Uh, so when when non dyadic. And, but this is false, actually. And the, the point is that there is a, a there is a third term that measures the failure of rigidity. And it's it's what's called topological cyclic homology and, and the real topological cyclic homology, which is trivially true when two is invertible. Uh, because when two is invertible, you have a, a Z1 over two module, and then you to complete a Z1 over two module, and that gets zero. Uh, but when two is not invertible, you have to compute it. And that's actually what I am working on right now. And okay, I had other stuff about the connection with L theory, but I don't think I'll have the time to talk about them. Uh, but okay, I, I'll just say another thing, you can assemble a bunch of other, assemble other unpublished results by various combinations 
even before the end of the sentence, this sounds non-ideal. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I mean, this is, this is literally stuff that has been, that is happening in the last couple of months. So oh, okay. Un uh, unpub unpublished just because it's new, not because it's- uh, It's because it's new, yeah, yeah. When I say unpublished, even these, I mean, the proof of these, I got it like, I think two months ago. Right. Uh, and I mean, I would have published already if, but I hope to, to get uh, to get more out of it before making it a paper. Um, a virus combination of nine, and also I should also mention Jay Shah, actually, that has done some work on this. Um, to, uh, and, uh, sorry, Irakli Bachkoria. And, uh, um, uh, am I saying, no, yeah, and Irakli Bachkoria and et cetera, that did some computations in, uh, in TCR in this uh, weird obstruction group that I uh, hinted at uh, to get more cases. Uh, in particular, uh, perfect F2 algebras is the one that I'm willing to vouch for, that I, I think I understand every single step and that it's correct. Uh, so I am kind of believing that this is going to be always true, give or take some completion issues. There's this finiteness condition here, actually, uh, uh, and here, and also this virtual cohomological dimension and dimension are due to essentially the fact that you need an additional completion, an I-adic completion, an I is the augmentation ideal that is hard to, to build in. Uh, in fact, I would really like to have a better understanding of this uh, I-adic completion in a way that allowed me to run the sent arguments to go from the local to the global case. That's, but okay. And also I have to say you can use, use these results to, and this is very surprising, to completely compute GW, uh, GS, F for F, a field of characteristic two. Uh, and in fact, let me. And that, that's because you know the K side. Uh, but, and also because the K side is particularly easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and in fact, let me say exactly what this thing is. F is zero if n is odd, uh, and uh, KNF, so this is in terms of KNF mod fiber over IFN, where this is the augmentation, the kernel from GWF to KF. It's uh, this augmentation ideal. And that's N is the, the power of the ideal in the, in the, in the ring. So I mean, maybe compute is a, is a hard, is, is a big word, but you know, it's computing in terms of K theory and, uh, and, and, and zero degree information. So I think it's, it's, a fa it's fair to call it computation. Uh, this was actually very surprising because these things are usually never possible to compute. Uh, but it turns out that everything uh, becomes easier. And I'm currently trying to find out if I can repeat the miracle for fields of characteristic different from two. Um, and also note that here I have no finiteness assumptions because it turns out that that small completion issue is actually not that important if you want to compute these things. Um, um, that, that, that it's, uh, it's sort of built in the fact that this guy is not the same thing as its own I completion, uh, but that's okay. And I think, sorry, what's that a question? You said, you said it's not the same thing as its own I completion. It's not I, com I mean, the finiteness condition that they put there was exactly to ensure that GW0 was I complete. That's equivalent to GW0 being I complete. In fact, what I prove precisely is that in that case, the homotopy groups of this guy are the I completion of the homotopy groups of this guy. Right. And so and so in particular, if the source was not I complete, uh, you cannot expect this to be an equivalence. Uh, but, uh, but that's sort of a, for me, it's a problem in the statement. You should make in the statement. Is, uh, okay. So I haven't found an elegant way of doing it yet. And I think I am out of time now. So I'll not talk about L theory. Great. So let's uh, we can we can uh, unmute ourselves and thanks and thank Dennis for at least for me a super enlightening talk.
Now, uh, great. So questions? Uh, I've got some, but I'll, uh, I should let other people ask too. So I was going to say, I mean, uh, of course, you got lots of uh, computations. I guess sort of interesting ones are, are somewhat interesting or mixed characteristic ones, like say the integers. Do you want to say anything about the integers? So. Yeah, well, one thing one thing we did actually in the in this paper with nine authors in paper three still we did we actually computed all uh, homotopy all, all GW groups of the integers conditional to the Van Diver conjecture, of course, uh, which is uh, the the being that we always have to to think. Although it is unconditional to the Van Diver conjecture up to degree twenty thousand, and so that's more of a coincidence than than <laughs> than actual. Uh, Actually, but it's cool to say actually we compute the first 20,000 groups <laughs> of the, the integers. That's just the Van der conjecture is not relevant. I mean, the unknown cases of the Van der conjecture are not relevant up to degree 20,000. So, uh, um, so you, you can actually use these techniques to do a lot more. You can compute the, the L groups that I haven't had time to define, but they are sort of the, the L groups are sort of the quotient you get of the hyperbolic map. Um, so you take this map from the, the orbits to GW, you, you get the quotient is something that's called L. And we can actually compute the L groups for all the Dedekind domains uh, where the fraction field is characteristic not two. And I have work in progress with Marcus Land to, to actually uh, fix uh, the, the, this missing characteristic two case. And actually, sorry, we have all characteristic for the symmetric. We have characteristic not two for the quadratic. Um, um, but we are. It's kind of weird because they're not finally generating the quadratic case. It's 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 what it is. We are we are working on it. More questions? Arnav, I don't know if you want to ask the uh, geometric topology question. If that's it. Oh, I was just curious. So, so you mentioned you can do some L theory computations. Are are these the sorts of computations that are useful in geometric topology and surgery theory? Or is it more like numbers? Yes, no, there, there, are, there are all sorts. Uh, there are definitely, so among, among uh, the, the nine authors, you might notice that there are at least two that are working on surgery theory. So these are Fabian Heberscheidt and Wolfgang Steiner. Uh, and they are definitely interested in that aspect. Uh, I am kind of not an expert of it, but you can do some interesting. For example, you can recover a bunch of classical results. Of course, that's less, that's less fun. But they also, you know, have some work in progress for new new stuff. Uh, that, uh, and even even so, we have a better understanding of the homotopy type of the L uh, theory spectrum of the integers, uh, which is, of course, the L groups are classical and well known since at least the eighties, probably earlier. Uh, but it's still useful to know uh, the more information on the K invariants and on the spectrum. And they they have, I think. Uh, Fabian Heberstein, Thomas Nikolaus, and I think Marcus Land have a paper about it. I'm just curious, useful for what? Uh, I mean, the point is that you can, if you are interested in studying in surgery theory, you're interested in, in essentially the homotopy type of this cobordism category. Right. And these actually, uh, sorry, cobordism category. And this has a map to what we call the algebraic cobordism category. Um, let's say Z. For, I mean, you can do fancier things, as you know, you can do um, group rings of the pi one, but let me do that. And this turns out to be exactly omega, uh, which is plus or minus one, plus one of GW uh, S uh, of Z, or whatever, you can, you can put any ring here, actually. In it. Yes. And this S is the S that I haven't defined today, sorry, but it's the one that's more relevant for surgery theory. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay. uh, and uh, uh, well, then you can ask, okay, what's the fiber of this map? Right. And if you understand, understand the fiber of this map, suddenly you know that understanding the homotopy type of these is more helpful than just knowing the homotopy groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Thank you. Cool. What, well, uh, so in, in your, um, so in the series of statements of cases where it's known, I, I so presume, uh, yeah, so in the, Method of proof, the things you said, it sounded like there are sort of several sort of chunks that are, there's several steps that are easier or harder in different situations. That, that, that uh, like these are not seven or eight completely independent proofs. That is like, I don't know, going from the, the residue field to the strictly Ancelian, going from strictly Ancelian to the full ring. What are the, what, what are the big? So roughly speaking, 
in the case of field, so homotopy limit problems, if you have the homotopy limit problem, and actually that's the reason why I like the homotopy limit problem because you really need to use everything to solve it, uh, which is to me at least is the, the marking of a good problem to try to, to attack. Uh, so for the homotopy limit problem in the case of fields, essentially it's done by a motivic method. So uh, uh, um, give or take an, uh, a careful study of the motivic spectral sequence for K-theory. And so essentially block cut or conjecture and, and its friends like geyser levin and um, uh, Milner conjecture for quadratic forms and etc. Uh, then you want to go from fields to um, uh, in serial local rings. So you want to, to spread it out a little bit. And then uh, yeah, the, the technique you have to use is what I call like trace methods, uh, which is that they are trivial in the case when two is invertible, but it's essentially, well, for those of you that are curious, it's, and this is the case, uh, I'm going to write a bunch of GWQ, GWGS of R, is the geometric six points of this TCR spectrum that um, and there is a fiber sequence like that. And this is actually should, it's still unpublished. There is, it was announced just recently at a conference a couple of weeks ago by um, Harpas, uh, Nikolaus, and Shah. And then you can try to, to do computations of these that have been done. These have been studied a lot by Dr. Uh, Pachikoria, um, Christian Moy, and actually I should also mention Sune Precht, although I, I think recently he hasn't worked a lot on this, uh, but he did some work. Um, so that's another ingredient you use. Uh, but it's this spectrum that since sounds mysterious, but it's actually um, uh, uh, more accessible. And in fact, in the case where you don't have that real numbers put there, you have just the C has been studied by uh, uh, Schulze and Bat and a lot of other people using uh, Matthew Morrow also using uh, perfectoid methods. And my current hope is actually to use perfectoid methods in this situation to try to uh, to to, uh, to to bridge this. Uh, sorry, what did they put here? Yeah, uh, why did they put this? Oh, okay, because this guy does satisfy rigidity. Sorry, that's the the, the point. The quadratic satisfies rigidity. Uh, which is, I guess, still unpublished in the most general case. I thought we have a very important special case in paper three. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, okay. And so use trace methods, and then you can, I hope this is a hope of more than a size, more a, a path than, than a proof to us perfectoid methods. So you can see that already there are a lot of stuff showing up. And then you have, you need from Hanselian local to uh, global, you need to run the sent arguments. And these uses, well, stuff that is done in nine and also in a forthcoming paper by, oh, sorry, Kalmet, Harpat, and myself, where we, we prove Nisnevich descent and, and uh, A1 invariance and what, what not for these things when two is not invertible. And I actually should probably put Schlicht in here for the, the case when two is invertible. I thought that's. Um, um, and I know that um, Arna Stripati, that is here presently, has also done work in, in, in the study of uh, the, the, the motivic properties of GW. Uh, but we won't use that particular result. I mean, this might play, I mean, who, who knows? Uh, this proof is not complete. Who knows? Maybe you need to use other ingredients. But uh, so you can see there are a lot of, of, of different uh, things that go into this spot. That's why I really like this problem. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to, to talk exactly about who. And actually, that's a fixed point. It's not the geometry. No, that's the geometry fixed point. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's equivalent homotopy theory stuff. I never defined anything of this. Uh, and actually, 
you know that that's that what I wrote is correct actually. Okay, good. Uh, uh, but okay, yeah, you can see there are different steps. So you use a lot of motivating exons for fields and suddenly they don't seem to be relevant anymore as soon as you go away from fields, which is good because, you know, trying to understand the K theory of non fields by motivic methods is, is basically impossible. I mean, not impossible, but it's really, really hard. 